We are not faithful in using your gifts. We forget the least of our siblings. We do not see your beautiful image in one another. We are infected by sin that divides your beloved community. Open our hearts to your coming. Open our eyes to see you in our neighbor. Open our hands to serve your creation. Amen. Beloved, we are God's children, and Jesus, our beloved, opens the door to us. Through Jesus, you are forgiven, and by Jesus, you are welcome. In Jesus, you are called to rejoice. Let us live in the promises prepared for us from the foundation of the world. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, we will remember our saints, so let us remember all of the saints before God. Hallelujah. They are before the throne of God, and the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. We praise and bless you, O Holy Trinity. You have taught your church that it is an ageless communion of saints. We thank you for gathering those who faithfully waited in hope for the redemption you promised and now are waiting for, uh, and now for adding us who celebrate the love of your Christ for the redemption of the world. Prepare a place for us among those who are already with you. Help us remember them as an encouragement to saintly living, exciting us to love in anticipation of an eternal reunion. With them we praise and bless you, O Holy Trinity. Amen. Todd Loomis. Bernadette Olson, Carol Erickson, Judy Teagan, Merle Fitzgerald, Merle Ernest, Shirley Mallon, Monica Brantner, Gerald Everson, and why don't you like the big one as we say, Yvonne Thorson. I invite you to respond as it's printed in your bulletin. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your souls. We sing our gathering song number 423 in the, in the red books, Shall We Gather at the River? You know better than I do what your protocol is. Do you stand? No, not necessarily. Okay.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God. Power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia! Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing and honor and glory and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit your people together in one communion in the mystical body of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant us grace to follow your blessed saints in lives of faith and commitment, and to know the inexpressible joys you have prepared for those who love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Well, let's not even go too far. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, well, one of the children, I just wasn't sure if you had more than one song, you know, if they were going to call for an encore or something. <laughs> Any other kids that would like to come forward for a children's sermon, come on up and sit on the steps, but watch out for the candles, okay? Let's not burn anybody. <laughs> anybody else that wants to come up can come up at this time. bunch of smiling faces. It's great to see you all. Oh. All right, can you find a place? What do you think? <laughs> you can sit right where you're at if you'd like. <laughs> I've had Sunday mornings like this. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming up. So today I'm kind of talking about people's names. So rather than go through and ask everybody's name on the count of three, just kind of shout out your name. One, two, three. Got it, okay. So have you ever had somebody mispronounce your first name? I knew somebody whose name was Anna. She spelled it A-N-A. But lots of people called her Anna, like it was A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, and it drove her just a little bit crazy sometimes, because it's not much fun to have people call you by the wrong name, right? Yeah. How do you, does your name have a special meaning? What's your special meaning? My name is Fire. Fire, mm -hmm, cool. Well, my first name is David, and that means beloved in the Hebrew language. And there was a very special king named David. And his great, 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 and then a few more great grandsons was Jesus. Interesting, right? Well, also, I'm named David because my father's name was Dale. And they figured David would probably be shortened to Dave sometimes, which it is. And Dave and Dale are pretty close. So, and my dad and I both had the same middle names. So we were kind of close that way. How about your last name? Did you choose your last name? Did you do anything to, to earn your last name or to deserve, it just kind of happened in there, right? In most cases, most of the time, our last names come from the families that we're born into, right? Now, it doesn't always happen that way. There are some times that that's not how it happens, um, but that's usually, anyway, how it happens. And that makes you the latest in a long list of people with that same last name who have gone back years and years and years. You're part of a, of a family that has gone back for, for many, many years. And your name is how people know you and remember you and remember your family as well. Now, just a little while ago, we heard some names read, and these were people from this church who had died in the past year. And we're sad about that, but at the same time, we say their names to keep them alive in our memories, because their names is how we remember them. Now, we're going to be hearing some readings. Two of them are actually written, the first two are actually written by the same person, even though they sound completely different. One of them sounds like some sort of weird uh, I don't know, fantasy movie, and the other one sounds more like a letter, but they're written by a na man named John. And if you listen to the second one, the second lesson, I, we've got the psalm in there too, but the second lesson from 1 John, it starts out, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. And that's going to remind us that God loves each of you and each of us so much that we've been given the name children of God. And it's not a name we can deserve. It's, we, we can't get that name by doing good stuff. It's a gift from God that God gives to us, kind of like your families gave you your name. And it makes us a long, part of a long list of people who are also children of God, some who are still here and some who have gone to be with God in heaven. Now someday you may change your name for some reason, for your first name, your last name, or whatever, but the, the name child of God or children of God is something that can never be changed, can never be taken away from us. 
we can always remember it as our name that has been given to us by God and we remind ourselves of that name because God loves us forever and ever. So let's say a quick prayer about that if you would. Join me in prayer. God, we thank you for those who we named who have gone before us in the faith. We also thank you for those who are here with us who are still part of our faith journey. We thank you for the names that have been given to us in love by parents, by others who have uh, nurtured us and helped us grow. But we especially thank you for the name child of God that has come from you because you love us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you to our singers and everybody else. Uh, everybody can go on back to wherever you're seated. Our first reading is from the book of Revelation. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white? And where have they come from? Excuse me. <clears throat> I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The word of the Lord. We will read our psalm responsively. I will bless the Lord at all times. The praise of God shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the Lord be here and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt God's name together. I, I saw the Lord who answered me and delivered me from all my terrors. Look upon the Lord and be radiant, and let not your faces be ashamed. I called to my affliction, and the Lord heard me, and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear the Lord, and delivers them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who take refuge in God. Fear the Lord, you saints of the Lord, for those who fear the Lord lack nothing. The lions are in want, and suffer hunger. O oh Lord, you be redeem the life of your servants, and those who put their trust in you will not be punished. Our, first, our next reading is from the first book of John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. 
the word of the Lord. Please stand as we sing the gospel acclamation as printed on the screen. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Well, anyone who has worked in law enforcement or the court system or certain other jobs know how hard it is to get people to agree on details. Six witnesses to a car accident or a store robbery will give six different versions of what happened. And that doesn't mean that any of them are lying or making anything up. It's just part of who we are as humans that we, end, we individually will notice and remember certain details based on factors like our own personal history, our biases, and even who we're telling the story to. The first three Gospels in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels because the authors tell the story of the life of Jesus in fairly similar ways. And it's generally assumed that they influenced one another while also drawing on some other external sources. But similar doesn't mean exactly the same. Most of us are familiar with our reading today from uh, Matthew, the Beatitudes is what, how, how we refer to them. But a similar scene appears in Luke with some noticeable changes. Now the most obvious difference is the setting. Matthew records that Jesus went up the mountain and then sat down to teach the crowd. And thus, in Matthew, the Beatitudes begin his long speech known as the Sermon on the Mount. Well, in Luke's version, Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place. And so in Luke, it's been given the, phrase, uh, the, the, the name, the Sermon on the Plain. The second difference is the content of what Jesus says. In Luke, Jesus uses the second person for all you grammatic people out there. Blessed are you. Well, Matthew switches the pronoun from you to those who are and makes some other changes and additions to the language. Luke wrote, blessed are you who are poor, while Matthew reads, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are you who are hungry, writes Luke, while Matthew has, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And Luke contains nothing about the meek, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers, or the persecuted. Now in good Lutheran fashion, we can ask the question, what does this mean? And some may kind of yawn and say, well, it's just semantics, the message is the same. Others might consider those differences significant. Our blessed are you who are poor and blessed are the poor in spirit really the same. In general, Matthew applies a more spiritual quality to the sayings, whereas Luke defines them as conditions of suffering. 
And so we go back to the lesson of those six witnesses. People retell events based on their own experience. Matthew and Luke are each influenced by his own personal history and viewpoint, and they were writing to audiences different from one another. There were many arguments about which of these versions came first, and I'm going to leave for another day. Uh, there have been attempts throughout the years to adequately, adequately translate the word, the Greek word, uh, makarii, which is how as blessed, makarioi, and blessed translation for a long while. But I don't know, the idea that the poor or the oppressed feel blessed has never sat well with everyone. Claim happy or contented is a better, more accurate translation, but calling the hungry and the persecuted happy has sense to me than using the word blessed. Is honored, and that seems to be a bit more palatable. How honorable are the poor in spirit, the hungry, the peacemakers? See, that removes the image of the marginalized somehow enjoying their plight. And it includes a comment then on a society that had forgotten to care for its oppressed members. If God honors those who, whom you consider beneath you, you may, need to think, you may need to rethink your spiritual understanding. And the same lesson is repeated in the first reading from the book of Revelation. In this vision from the author John, a great multitude surrounds the throne. And an elder asks, who are these people? Well, and then he answers his own question. They have come out of the great ordeal. And that is why he adds that they are gathered around the throne. The one seated on the throne God will protect them. They won't be hungry or thirsty anymore. Jesus will be their shepherd and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now John is not arguing there that we as humans should gl gladly seek out suffering, the ordeal, or that suffering is necessary somehow to join the multitude that gathers around God's throne. What it does mean is that God responds to our sufferings. We are never abandoned. Christians also have a tendency to understand the Beatitudes to mean that the poor and the meek are destined to suffer in this lifetime, but then will be richly rewarded in heaven. And that may be, but this allows us to shake our heads in pity for their bad fortune now without feeling much urge to provide relief. And that's not Jesus' point either. He's illustrating how ignoring or dismissing the physical and spiritual needs of our neighbor in the here and now is contrary to God's intention for God's kingdom. There shouldn't be oppression, Jesus says, but since you are allowing it to happen, it will be up to God to one day flip things around. As mentioned, Matthew sets today's scene on a mountain, and that might remind us of Moses on top of Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, and that may be why Matthew chose specifically to place the setting on a mountain. Jesus, like Moses, is proclaiming God's vision for the world. The Ten Commandments are certainly rules of conduct that God expects. And Jesus gives some very clear instructions throughout the Sermon on the Mount. But apart from imposing God's expectations, the commandments and Jesus' teachings are guides for living our lives pleasing to our Creator. God desires togetherness and wholeness among all people, even maybe especially the oppressed and the marginalized. We are called to follow these guidelines in praise and thanksgiving for God's grace and to acknowledge God's holiness and our duty to show him obedience. Okay, so what does our report card look like? How are we as a people of God doing in fulfilling our duties? 
Are the meek poised to inherit the earth? Are all the hungry and thirsty filled? Well, not exactly. Nor were they in Jesus' day. In fact, there's been no time in human history that I know of where vulnerability or persecution ever resulted in power, and that's not likely to change anytime soon. To be honest, the Beatitudes are absurd. And in that way, they are quite similar to the unreachable ideals of the Ten Commandments. God's imagined vision for his creation turns the patterns of this world upside down. God gives us these expectations while all the while knowing we'll never totally succeed. But that doesn't relieve us from our responsibility to always have them as our goal. Here we are on All Saints Sunday and it's possible that someone here today will question if a certain person on that list in our bulletin really qualifies as a saint based on how they lived. But alas, we don't get a vote. God's blessings are promised even on those whom we might think are unblessable. Sanctity does not come from humans, it comes from the one who sits on the throne and from the Lamb who is our Good Shepherd. The Apostle Paul wrote, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And since none of us deserves God's grace and mercy, we have no place thinking we can tell God how to portion it out. God calls us to love one another and leave the big decisions to him. Now one author I read asked the question, where would Jesus deliver the Beatitudes today and who would he call honored? Now, I don't know exactly where Jesus might show up to deliver the Sermon on the Mount again, but who are the oppressed and marginalized that Jesus would hold up as an example of how our society fails to care and provide for those who we consider unblessable? Would it be those in foreign nations seeking asylum from unrest and violence in their homeland? Would it be the average everyday Israeli or Palestinian person merely trying to continue an everyday existence while his or her life is threatened by the decisions of others? Would it be those in this country who are disparaged because of the color of their skin, how they understand and identify themselves, who they vote for, or who they fall in love with? Would it be people, whether in the community, the nation, or other places around the globe who don't have basic needs like food, clean water, and adequate health care due to greed, corruption, and apathy. Now that's not meant as a guilt trip. No individual or single congregation can change the whole world. I received the reports of the amazing turnout for the recent Sleep in Heavenly Peace bed build here in Mondovi and it filled my heart. And I'm sure that this church and those who sit in these pews have other ways of making a difference in the community and the world, just as the church in Osseo and its members have various ways. But we shouldn't be satisfied. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to always seek new ways of reaching out in love to our neighbor, whether the one close by or the one across the globe. On this All Saints Sunday, how honorable are those who have been part of our lives and our faith journeys and are now gathered among the multitude around the throne. How honored we are to have a God who promises to protect our departed saints and a good shepherd who promises to tend and care for them. We show our gratitude by following the example our good shepherd showed us in his time here on earth. And we look forward to the day when we'll be reunited with all who have gone before us in the eternal kingdom. Amen. 
I invite you to turn in your hymnals to number 732 for our hymn of the day, Born and Cry. Let us turn our hearts to God, our breath and life, as we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Holy God, the church triumphant gathers around your throne to praise you. We join them in worship and remember your sustaining grace in every generation. Heal our divisions, show us unity in your presence. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Creator, we marvel at your creation revealed in the cycle of seasons, changing landscapes, and the rise and fall of ocean tides. Turn us from selfish consumption and open us to gentle healing of the earth so all creation thrives. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Advocate, we lift grateful hearts for the ability to vote and elect leaders. Grant wisdom to those who will be elected and safety to poll workers. May civic leaders serve the whole community, especially all who are underrepresented or oppressed. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Healer, bless the brokenhearted and all who mourn. Send your compassion to all who grieve. Grant wholeness to those who are sick and accompany the dying. Be near to all who need you. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy Comforter, we pray for this congregation that the promise of your new life may be shared and experienced. We pray for the funeral ministry of this place, that families and friends seeking your love find it here. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, we give you thanks for the saints who now rest in your mercy. We remember their witnesses of faithfulness and love and praise you for the eternal life they have been given through Jesus Christ. Hear us, O God. 
your mercy is great. We offer our spoken prayers and those held in our hearts, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to stand at this time and share a sign of peace as you feel comfortable. Should please stand as you are able as, and sing our uh, offertory hymn as the plates are brought forward. God of all goodness, generations have turned to you, gathered around your table, and shared your abundant blessings. Number us among them, that as we gather these gifts from your abundance and give thanks for your rich blessings, we may feast upon your very self and care for all that you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our sovereign and servant. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our right, our duty, and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the witness of the saints, you show us the hope of our calling and strengthen us to run the race set before us. 
that we may delight in your mercy and rejoice with them in glory. And so with the choirs of angels and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy. night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, given and shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O God, and pray as our Lord Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. My understanding is that it's so usual to have people come to the altar. We'll start on the pulpit side and work our way around. We do have gluten-free wafers that are in cellophane wrap. If you so need, please ask for that. Uh, give us just a moment and then come as you are ready.
invite you to please stand as you are able. As we bless the home communion kits, gracious God, loving all your family with a mother's tender care, as you sent the angel to feed Elijah with heavenly bread, assist those who set forth to share your word and sacrament with those who are sick or homebound. In your love and care, nourish and strengthen those who will receive this sacrament and give us all the comfort of your abiding presence through the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in this simple meal you have set a banquet. Sustain us on the journey. Strengthen us to care for the least of your beloved children and give us glad and generous hearts as we meet you on the way. Amen. May the God of all creation, in whose image we are made, who claims us and calls us beloved, who strengthens us for service, give you reason to rejoice and be glad. The blessing of God, sovereign Savior and Spirit be with you today and always. Amen. Beloved of God, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. And we sing our sending song for all the saints, verses 1 and 2. Again, you know your tradition if you stand or sit. <laughs>